Yeah, but they wanted to show, prove that it was feasible. So I was part of the feasibility study to see if it was feasible, in terms it was. Part of that study was bringing a contingent of 12 Mitsubishi people to the Belvedere assembly plant, because that's the plant they wanted. They didn't want to build new field, a new plant. They wanted that Belvedere plant. So they wanted to go to Belvedere and we were building building the Omni Horizon there at that time. And so they wanted to see that plant. So I, we brought the 12 of them in there. And I went up there and Mr. Arai was the head manufacturing guy, vice president there. And he said to Sam Joe Bonanno, I said Sam Bonanno. Sam Bonanno. Sam Bonanno. He said to the plant manager, Sam Bonanno, who was pretty much showing us around. He said, Mr. Pinano, would you measure the door opening on 10 cars tonight and I'd like to see them tomorrow? Because Rye had something up here. And so the next day, Sam presents the data to Rye and Rye looks at it and he says, I thought so. This is also an interpreter. He said, this car, these cars would not be good enough for Japan. He said, because you are way outside of our tolerances. So we examined that a little bit, found out, number one, their tolerances on door openings from car to car were one half of ours, their specification. Number two, we were building ours to specification. Our specifications were going 10 to 20 percent outside of our own specs. And so what I learned from them, their specification is the gospel, is the Bible there, and they hold to it. And I'll tell you, I think that we do in America that we've improved dramatically. The problem is they haven't stood still. They're continuing to get better, but we've closed the gap a lot. Our cars are fit and finish, and our cars are pretty darn good. I'm not sure they're not. I think they're now at the level where you have to be an expert to see the difference between an American car and a Japanese car. Are they building a better, are the Japanese Maybe building a better good. car in America than our companies are building in America? Yeah. yeah. In other words, is a Toyota a, a better car than a, you know, than, than some Chrysler Corporation car well, or anything like that? I got the answer. Toyota is building Toyota standards to Toyota standards in America or Japan. Mm -hmm. They're building the same standards. I see. <coughs> yeah, that's the answer right there. Sure. Uh, when I told people when I worked in Japan for four years, we had manufacturing people come over all the time. I told them pay attention to everything that happens on the shop floor. Pay no attention to what happens in the office. Because they are terribly inefficient in the office. They're fantastically, they're fantastically efficient on the shop floor. I got, it. I took, uh, well, you know, Adolf Smith. I took Adolf Smith through uh, a plant over there called the Okazaki plant, and he. It was it Adolf? I think it was Adolf, but it might have been somebody. It might have been George Butts. No, it was George. George said to the plant manager, "All oh, this all sounds simple, but it goes through an interpreter over there. It takes a long time to have these conversations." George says to the plant manager, "Do you water test cars?" The plant manager says, "Yes." George said, "I didn't." He was vice president of the manufacturing. George, at Chrysler, George said, I didn't see where you water test cars. Oh, yes, Mr. Butts, we water test cars. Would you like to see that? George said, yes, I'd like to see that. So we go over, the car's all completed, goes through water test. George, we're on the way back to the hotel and he's really bothered. 
really thinking about this. He's very troubled. He said, I got it. Because we water test the cars too, but we water test them before we put any of the trim in, before we put the seats in, before we put the door trim panels on, before any of that. George said, I got it. I, got it. I finally got it. They test cars like they don't expect them to leak. We test cars like we do expect them. <laughs> so true. Very good. Yeah. Cool. Interesting. I'm sure my trunk's full of water right now. Yeah. By your dodge, I don't know. The tea a little bit. We've come a long way. I don't know how we. Do you know how we water test cars today, John? We do them at the end of the line. Do we? Yeah. Great. <laughs> All right. But they still leak. <laughs> In 1957, during this troublesome year, we started production and we stopped production several times to try to fix problems. The town were so big, we couldn't fix them on the fly. We did something that they say we never did, but we did. We stopped the line. Might be down a day or two while they're fixing problems. And then we start the line up again. And, and when we went out to the field to try to tell them what we were doing, we are fixing them again. You guys got trouble, but let me tell you guys, we're trying to work on the back of the factory. We're working hard, night and day to fix it. In fact, we're working so hard, we are putting a, in the Imperial, we're putting a guy in the trunk of the Imperial, of every Imperial, when it goes through water tests, to be sure we know where the leaks are and we're fixed. And some dealer in Lubbock, Texas yelled out from the back of the room, let the poor son of a bitch out, he'll drown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, you know, everybody understands that the 57 cars came out too early. They were a huge success because of the styling, but then the quality. But if they had waited a year until 58, which was an economically depressed year. I mean, the styling would have pulled them somewhat, but it still would have been a really tough year to, to make some money. Yeah, it, it would have. I would have. We saw a lot of cars that you said. You know, I don't, you guys, you know about the broken torsion bar problem? My dad tells me about that all the time. He had a gas station in the 40s and 50s. He says the Chrysler's would come in and there'd be a pop. And they just go down to the ground. I don't know where. That was a direct pop too. Yeah. The problem was corrosion. Once we knew what the problem was, we sealed up the cavity so you couldn't get salt and mud in around the bar. And that would have been that would have been uncovered in my opinion if we'd have had an additional year of testing. What I never figured out is why they broke while well, they were parked. Yeah. Yeah. Almost all of them broke. They didn't break while people were driving. They, they, they broke while they were sitting in the garage at night, sitting in the driveway at night or something. My father's 57 New Yorker broke when I was standing about four feet away from it. I thought I'd been shot. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like a shotgun. Was it, was it sitting still? The car? Yeah, sitting in front of the house. <laughs> no, it was like, I thought the tire exploded. Yeah. <laughs> oh, did, did they? It seems strange too that I mean you've got a, you got a thick bar over there. A little bit of surface rust on the thing will make it break. That's the highest. Is that because of the case hardening on it or what? For a torsion bar, that's the highest stress part of the yeah. bar. Yeah. Is the exterior. Yeah. So those. So when it got itched, well, yeah. corrosion, those became stress risers. What they yeah. call stress risers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The yeah. other thing is. Did they ever look in the metallurgy? <laughs> well, metallurgy. Yeah. Things like hydrogen and brittleman. Could have been. Have entered into it too. Could have been. Because we've had bolts in the transmission, uh, especially from New Venture Gear, that torqued everything. 
It might go for a year or two, all of a sudden, bam, like that one break, or two of them break, it just snap off. And it, that's what it was. Well, you're, you don't think it was corrosion? No, I know it wasn't. It was inside the transmission. Well, we, we put all kinds of changes in production to keep the salt and mud out of there.